ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, Normans, Arabs, Byzantines, French, Spanish, and eventually Italians. Christians and Muslims and Orthodox, architecture, mafia, pizza, straw hats, and glorious wine in the past, an amazing volcano. Meet the homeland of many ancient Greek gods. The scene of many myths. The workplace of Plato, Archimedes, and Pythagoras. The triangle of islands in the center of the Mediterranean. Sicily. Today we will talk about the history of one of the most important points on the map of the Mediterranean. About an island that has attracted dozens of cultures throughout its existence. And just about an interesting place, Sicily. The history of Sicily still remains the original history of Greece. The island was part of a large Greece populated by colonizers. And it would mostly remain a Greek possession even under Latin rule. This is quite funny, considering the proximity of these beautiful places to the Eternal City. By the 3rd century BCE, Sicily was locked between two major empires. Of the Mediterranean, the Roman Republic and Carthage. And although Hannibal himself never landed in Sicily, the island was still the subject of rivalry between Rome and Carthage. The Carthaginians failed to dominate the Mediterranean. Sicily became a Roman province. It remained so for centuries. It was a fairly quiet time for Sicily. They spoke Greek there, and the culture was more Greek than Roman. Slaves were brought from everywhere from Asia Minor, Egypt, Western Europe in general, literally from everywhere. All of this formed the main feature of the island, multiculturalism. Here, the geographical location played a role, and the fact that anything could be grown on this land. However, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Sicily fell too. Ostrogoths and Vandals passed through the island without stopping. And in the future, the island would return to the lap of Greek civilization under the Byzantine Emperor Justinian for 400 years. While the entire Western Empire clung to its Latin roots, Sicily gladly rid itself of the same Latin and fully switched to Greek. Despite the opinions of the Greeks and Byzantines regarding Sicily, no one could have anticipated the arrival of the Arabs and the impact they would have on the island's history. And the Arab expansion began not with war as one might think, but with trade. During the Arab rule, which lasted from the 9th to the 11th century, Sicily experienced a significant period of growth and prosperity. Arab merchants initially established themselves in Syracuse, and eventually, Arab soldiers extended their control over the rest of the island, creating the Sicilian Emirate. One reason for Sicily's success during this time was the importation of high-yielding plants such as oranges from North Africa and the Middle East. The Sicilian orange also known as the blood orange, is still famous today. Additionally the Arab rulers were known for their religious tolerance, which promoted stability and allowed for the inclusion of local producers. Both Christian and Muslim in the Arab trade system. Even Jewish traders were patronized, though non-Muslims still had to pay the jizya tax. Sicily's unique geographical location between Arab, Greek, and European civilizations, combined with its cultural characteristics and trading links made it the most prosperous place on the Mediterranean. And the most remarkable thing is that this prosperity was not planned but the result of fortunate circumstances. By the 11th century southern Italy and Sicily, in particular were embroiled in a power struggle involving Lombards, Normans, Arabs, and Byzantines. In 1059 Pope Nicholas II granted the title of Duke of Apulia, Calabria, and Sicily to Robert Guiscard, the son of a minor French baron. It was a rather strange gesture because Sicily still belonged to the Sicilian Emirate, not the Roman Pope. So in fact, this bestowed title represented permission for conquest. Sicily was conquered under the slogan of freeing Christian brothers from Muslim oppression. For some reason, the local Christians did not appreciate this enthusiasm. And as a result, the conquest of Sicily lasted for 31 years. This was generally due to the fact that the Arab world had been good rulers. Nevertheless, the Normans in some ways were ahead of their time because it was, in fact, the Crusade number zero, decades before the era of the Crusades began. Arab immigration away from the island began several decades before the start of the Crusades era. It soon became clear that the knights from the mainland were not very capable of state management. So they had to bring back Arabs and other Muslims to various government positions. During the Middle Ages Sicily reflected the Islamic world's attitudes. Islamic law was used in legal proceedings and Arabic became one of the official state languages. Along with Greek, 
Latin, and Norman French. Moreover the Sicilian language, still spoken by around 10 million people, was predominant. The combination of retaining Arabic elements in the governance system, multiculturalism, and the military talent of the Norman rulers contributed to Sicily's success. The economy grew rapidly in the Strait of Messina, separating the island from the Italian peninsula. Became an important trade hub with the cities of Messina and Syracuse attracting foreign merchants. Roger II became king of Sicily, Apulia, and Calabria in the 12th century, marking the beginning of the Sicilian kingdom's golden age. At that time it was the third largest state in Europe. It's also important to note that by the 12th century, Sicily had not fully succumbed to feudalism, which had fragmented and decentralized the rest of Western Europe. The absence of powerful feudal lords worked in favor of the state, allowing for proper centralization. However, in southern Italy, just three kilometers across the Messina Strait from Sicily, feudal barons were less willing to obey orders from the capital of Palermo. They lacked experience and were not allowed to participate in government, which caused further tensions. Despite these difficulties, Sicily continued to achieve remarkable feats, including the formation of a unique architectural style that combined local cultural traditions. For those in Western Europe seeking to learn about the achievements of Greek and Arab cultures, Sicily was the perfect destination. Greek originals could be found in monasteries near Palermo, and unlike Muslim Spain, Sicily was still culturally connected to the Arab world. Furthermore, the Sicilians were particularly enthusiastic about maintaining close ties with Byzantium, which was not the case in Western Europe at the time. After the death of Roger II in 1154, the Byzantine Empire once again became interested in bringing southern Italy back under its control, and in general, they sent a new military expedition there, which was supported by local rebellious southern Italian barons, who for some reason thought it would be easier for them with the Byzantine Emperor. In any case, after a couple of defeats, the Sicilians prevailed because Roger's successor, William, was an excellent military leader and dealt such blows to both the Byzantines and the Sicilian barons who supported them. The Roman Pope was forced to recognize William's authority not only in Sicily but also in Apulia and Calabria, as well as in the north, where Brus and Rome were only 100 kilometers apart. For many rulers of this time, Sicilian kings became such an example to emulate. They were heroes and stars of their time. It got to the point that individual feudal lords from northern Italy, which was mostly controlled by the Holy Roman Empire, saw William II of Sicily as their defender and protector. William of Sicily was extremely popular. He was considered by many Europeans to be on par with other great rulers such as Frederick Barbarossa. This was especially true after the Sicilian fleet helped save Tripoli and Tyre from the attacks of Saladin. However, all of these successes were temporary. William was not a good statesman. He first allowed a palace coup, which resulted in the death of his heir. Then, during an act of bloody revenge, William killed thousands of local residents. Causing rebellion to erupt throughout the island and shattering all interfaith harmony, Sicily's main international brand. The situation stabilized during the reign of William II, but after his death without an heir, a dynastic crisis emerged. The power eventually passed to Henry VI, the Holy Roman Emperor and Roger II's son-in-law. This surprised many as the Holy Roman Empire was traditionally a rival of the Sicilian Kingdom. After Henry VI claimed his rights to the kingdom, he almost met no armed resistance as he marched towards Palermo. The rebellious barons of Sicily proved no match for the powerful German Emperor, Henry VI, who claimed the kingdom as his own. Unfortunately, he didn't have much love for Sicily and saw it as just another possession to exploit. Legend has it that he even needed 150 mules to transport all the treasures he looted back to Germany through the Alps. It's a sad story of conquest and exploitation that speaks volumes about the military capabilities of Sicily at that time. This, of course, caused some resistance, but Henry suppressed the rebellion with perverse cruelty. He castrated and burned alive the rebels drove red-hot pokers into their foreheads, and so on. Sicily's complex mix of cultures, languages, and religions made it difficult to unite under one ruler. Chaos often ensued whenever individual regions or feudal lords became too powerful. After the death of Frederick, 
the chaos returned. Even the Pope, who had a claim to the kingdom, couldn't keep things together. Rome eventually tired of trying and simply offered the island to whoever could conquer it. Enter Charles I, the Duke of Anjou and brother of the French king. In the Battle of Benevento in 1266, the Hohenstaufen dynasty fell. In the same year, Charles of Anjou was crowned as the King of Sicily, and the French officials, French nobility, French language, and the Pope suddenly gained unprecedented power in the region. The Golden Age of Sicily, which began with the rule of the first Norman kings, came to an end. The new power shifted the political center to the mainland, and Naples became the capital of the Sicilian kingdom. Palermo and all of Sicily ceased to play an important role in the state's politics. The lands that were distributed under the Hohenstaufens were confiscated in favor of French feudal lords. The laws that previously applied in Sicily were naturally abolished. All of this, as well as the dominance of the French administration, led to baronial rebellions, which were once again supported by peasants. This resulted in a genuine national liberation movement of the Sicilians against French rule. The uprising took place on Easter of 1282, and the signal for its start was the evening bells ringing, which is why the events that followed entered history as the Sicilian Vespers. The following six weeks saw the killing of about 13,000 Frenchmen. In general, this bloody figure is all that needs to be known about the popularity of Charles of Anjou, the French king, French laws, and everything else in southern Italy at the time. However, it was difficult to defeat Charles of Anjou with one's own forces. At the beginning of the 13th century, migrants from Sicily spread in all directions, particularly to Aragon. These were the same rebellious but bloodless barons, peasants who had lost their estates, and other dissatisfied individuals. The Kingdom of Aragon in the northeast of the Iberian Peninsula became their sanctuary. There, in the quarters of the Barcelona court, a plan was hatched to fight against Charles of Anjou. However, coming up with it was not so difficult since the French were hated by almost everyone at the time. Even the Byzantine Empire got involved in the struggle against Charles. In the end, despite Rome's opposition, in 1285, Pedro III of Aragon won the war and promised Sicilians anything they wanted. What did he actually do? He promised to return the land grants that had been taken from local barons. He promised to unite the Kingdom of Sicily with Aragon. He promised various forms of independence and autonomy. In the end, his conflict with Charles of Anjou resulted in Pedro being excommunicated from the church, and even a crusade was almost launched against Barcelona. Conflicts with the Angevins continued for some time. In the 14th century, the division of Sicily into the island and peninsular parts became official. In effect, the independent Neapolitan kingdom was formed with the Angevin dynasty and the Sicilian kingdom with the Aragonese. During those years, the old ancient name of the island, Trinacria, was resurrected. By the way, this division would later become the basis for the kingdom of the two Sicilies, but more on that later. The period of Aragonese rule was a rather dull time, but there is an interesting moment here. Naturally, all of Pedro III's promises were not fulfilled. Spanish aristocracy began to engage in land grabbing. Sicily became part of the Kingdom of Aragon after the extinction of the dynasty in 1409. And after the unification of the Pyrenees under the banner of the Spanish king and into Spain. It was treated as a colony and experienced all the joys of remote management from Madrid. At the same time, a very important process was taking place, which can be called the baronization of Sicily. After losing a central government that could keep them in check, the Sicilian barons began to act recklessly. Soon, instead of loyal feudal lords, Spain received rebellious feudal lords. The baronization of Sicily led to reckless expansion of land holdings and rebellious feudal lords. Even during the Italian Renaissance, Sicily was unable to flourish due to Spanish colonization. In the 15th century, Sicily was hit by a wave of Berber pirates that terrorized the Mediterranean. In the 17th century, it suffered greatly from the Black Death, and in 1693, a monstrous earthquake killed about 5% of the island's population. Sicily changed hands among European dynasties, including the Spanish Habsburgs, Spanish Bourbons, and House of Savoy, before returning to the Bourbons in the 18th century. Poverty characterized the island during this time, and it faced the Napoleonic Wars in the late 18th century. The national liberation movement of the Italian people, known as the Risorgimento, 
saw the rise of Sicilian leaders like Francesco Crispi. In 1860, Garibaldi and his volunteers sailed to Sicily and liberated the island from the Bourbons. A referendum in southern Italy showed overwhelming support for integration into a unified Italy under Victor Emmanuel. The unification of Italy marked an important chapter in the country's history and the role that Sicily played in it cannot be overlooked. This is especially noteworthy. Because the rebellion that ultimately led to the unification of Italy, began in Sicily. The new Piedmontese regime was almost as unpopular there as the Bourbons had been before them. It turned out that the various regions of Italy had drifted too far apart over centuries of fragmentation. The cultural divide between the urbanized and developed north and the feudal, almost medieval south was simply immense. In reality, it was a different world, living by its own laws and concepts that had been formed over centuries. The main one of which was family ties, which was one of the reasons for the famous Sicilian camaraderie and corruption. And the power of Sicilian barons cannot be limited by the Italian kingdom. In the end, Sicily became a stronghold of lawlessness in the new Italy. It was this status that glorified the famous mafia. Despite its tumultuous past and rocky relationship with the rest of Italy, Sicily remains a fascinating and complex part of Italian history. From enduring pirate attacks, plagues, and earthquakes to playing a pivotal role in the unification of Italy, Sicily has a unique story to tell. However, the island's struggles with poverty, corruption, and lawlessness have also given rise to the infamous Sicilian Mafia. While the island's history is far from perfect, it remains an intriguing and important piece of the Italian puzzle.